Innate helps companies avoid project surprises, make better informed decisions, share knowledge, and deliver better outcomes. Innate, transforming the way the world builds. Hello, project people. Welcome back to a brand new episode of the Project Chatter podcast. It's always good to have you with us. And we've got Dale in a new space, but still here with us. Hey, Dale, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Um, I'm not in outer space, so I'm, I'm still connected. I'm still here. Um, yeah, doing very well. Well, end of a, a long week. How are you? Good. Good, my friend. Good. Not too long till uh, my first amateur MMA bout, where I've yeah, raised any, already $1,000. Any black eyes this time around? No, but I did. Uh, I did tear a tendon in my ankle, so I've got a torn AC <laughs> and I've got a torn ankle. <laughs> so, it, I'm getting old, Dale. I'm getting old. Yeah, we um, all are. We all are. Yeah, but uh, look, let's let's introduce our guest today and the guest's topic, uh, which will be around tact timing. Spencer Easton, how are you, sir? Doing really good. Great to be here with you. Mate, we had some great conversations even before, before we press record, and I know this is going to be a really, really good podcast uh, talking about tact. Now, before we get into the real detail and get all geeky for the listeners, what is it, Spencer? Where do we start? So tact is the German word for beat or rhythm. And at its core, tact is a location by time system that helps you to identify the flow of your project. So at its core, it's it's a flow system, and that's trying to wrap it into a small definition in, in term that that's probably uh, close. Uh, a lot of people will talk about you know rhythm and and consistency and and predictability and and all of those things are are really important and good. But tracking flow and you can see multiple types of flow, and that's what's really helpful about it. A lot of folks will know like the line of balance or, or location based tools, those are all derivatives, kind of primal derivatives of tax planning. And tax has been around um, actually longer than CPM has been, weirdly. <laughs> it's used mostly yeah. uh, in manufacturing as a, as a standard, but uh, it's kind of making a new wave come back into construction. And I'll, I'll show you, if I, have, I have one major example um, here in the U.S., and then another kind of minor one that everyone will, will know. So two really good examples of of tack planning that I, that I'll show later on. But um, yeah, that that in its nutshell is is the is the process. That's awesome. And uh, I, I mean, we got so many different questions because it's not necessarily widely known. I think tact has bounced around, but not necessarily been adopted, particularly in Australia, because I'm I'm in Australia, so. Um, I know that it has come up in a lot of conversational circles on social media, and hence we we had this conversation. But I'm, I'm interested about you as well, Spencer. How did you get into this? Where did you start? Because we, we had some pretty interesting conversations a minute ago. Um, how did you fall into this? So I was born into it. Uh, my dad was in construction. <laughs> his dad was uh, was a, a creator, a maker, and his dad was a was a builder, creator, maker, and and that's just kind of in my blood. So I was I was born and raised going out to job sites, uh, was working from a young age, uh, unpaid labor. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that was my upbringing. And when I uh, uh, left high school, I didn't I wasn't really focused um, in high school, and I was just you know whatever. So I started working as a labor, as you know, a guy with a shovel in my hand, broom in my hand, and not doing anything important. Worked up to being a, a dirt work operator. And uh, uh, then started jumping around on concrete crews and doing some, you know, more difficult stuff. And and after a while, I actually remember this. Uh, I was sitting in a port john thinking to myself, I am done with this. I don't want to sit in this hot weather anymore. I don't want to use this muscle. I want to use this muscle. I'm done. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, I, I decided to go to uh college and try to make my way there and i had to start out really really small because i didn't have good grades so i started at a community college and then worked up into the university and and graduated uh with my construction management degree i was a lot um older than uh, some of my peers and because i didn't take the traditional route 
And uh, the, the university that I went to, um, uh, I decided to go there because they offered night courses and I had to work uh, my way through college. I worked full-time uh, in construction during the day, sweaty, sweaty, and then went to school uh, all night. I took a minimum of 18, 19 credit hours a semester to try to get through it. And uh, uh, that's what kind of landed me into the scheduling realm of, of construction on the, on the office side. I uh, had spent some time um, during that time in, in school. I, you know, started coming into the office a little and I did some estimating help and some pro, uh, what we call project engineering here in the, in the U S and, and uh, um, some different tasks here and there. And then I started as a draftsman, did that for about a year, um, learned AutoCAD. And I thought that was super fascinating because it's taking the reality and drawing it out, you know, in a, in a computer system, which I loved. And so, um, you know, kind of made that transition from field, which was about half of my career to office, which has been about the other half of my career and been about 18 years, same as Uval uh, in construction. Mm. So that's kind of been my journey up until this point. And, and uh, when I, when I left a, a larger GC here in uh, general contractor here in the, in the States and started a consulting firm, I was the, the uh, department head of, of uh, the scheduling department. We had 18 schedulers um, with us and, and uh, we were having a blast and wanted to share some of the, the successes that we had had with lean and tact with the world because it were, was working so well in the places where we had, t we had tested it that we wanted to share it with the world. So we ended up, um, me and a, a friend of mine by the name of Jason Schroeder, we started a consulting firm and, and wrote the book Tact Planning and Integrated Control which is out nice. on Amazon, but um, uh, to try to spread it as much as we physically could. The audiobook is free on his podcast. And we, we just want to share that with the industry because that's just who we are, builders that want to help other builders get home on time and, and not have to, you know, put in these, you know, 15 hour days like some do, uh, sadly. So mm. that's, that's kind of been the, the, the reason of, of, uh, I guess why I'm here is is uh, my love for kind of these new systems and tools that are really helping us to improve efficiency and would like to see if it's helping others and, and spread that. So, yeah. That's awesome. And how did you, I mean, was it something, is this common in the US, this tax planning, or is it something oh. you stumbled upon? Because I imagine being in scheduling, you would have gone down the route of, especially for construction, critical path method, P6. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. big schedules of work that have a big updating cycle and yep. they're never updated in time and you've missed updates and progress is missing and the critical path no one believes in and uh and everyone messes around <laughs> with the logic you know all these things that happen um and then did you go this is not cool i'm gonna go find something else how did that happen uh yeah all of the above <laughs> so <laughs> at first when i when i when so i started a company called oakland construction they do about okay. 2 billion in revenue us uh, dollars a year and uh when i first started there was a couple folks that came to me and said you know no one reads your schedule or they would say something like <laughs> you're a mickey mouse schedule or i could wipe my you know whatever mm. you know and so mm. a lot of like comments i was like why are they saying this and so i tried to dig in and i wanted to learn more why are they saying that and try to try to fix the problem. And uh, so I was like, well, maybe the problem's me. So I started going out, okay, I need to get better certified, better education and, you know, P6 and try to learn these things. And so I got certified by Oracle and by the Project Management Institute and by the AC AACE and like all of these different, you know, industry leaders out there, the AGC, like all these folks, like I want anything that I could get certified or learn from or read a book um, as much as I could. And uh, I realized we weren't too far off from what the industry standards are. We were basically doing mm -hmm. it right. There, there, there's some nuances, you know, at different companies or different places. And, and so I was like, so the system is broken or is there some way we can make it easier or I don't know. And so um, mm -hmm. I just started on this, this path of learning. And uh, around 2017, I stumbled upon... Um, uh, lean construction and started learning about what the last, I don't know if you've heard of the last planner system, but you know, pole mm -hmm. planning, that whole concept yep. and, uh, tact is, is pretty connected to that. Uh, um, it comes from kind of that lean thinking that, that, uh, 
uh, lean manufacturing where all of this kind of came from the Toyota production system. And so that was, that was part of, of my learning. The first time I saw it, I was like, ah, oh, this, this, there's nothing here. And, um, uh, I remember thinking that it's, it's not a man's schedule. That's what I told myself. <laughs> and I was in a position at Oakland where, um, we were asked to do one. And so I had to do it. And so, um, I, I did a, it was a preliminary, we weren't in construction yet. It was, it was pre-construction and I, I just mapped it out. And afterwards kind of stepping back and looking at it, I was like, this is way easier to read and understand. Like, I was like, there's, this communicates way better. So that was my first, like, there's something mm. better here and just simply communicating that just works. So it bridges that gap of misunderstanding or misaligned expectations or whatever. Right. So I was like, at least to communicate, this is way better. And so that that's where my initial like plunge into it was. And from there we started like testing just the, you know, can we communicate better? And that was, that was our first dive. And we started doing a lot of different, you know, um, uh, projects early on with it to communicate. And a, a bunch of owners had mentioned that they wanted to, you know, uh, award us the project because finally there's a contractor that can, you know, speak to them in a way that they can understand, which was mm. weird because they're the ones that are telling us to give them the P6 anyway. So <laughs> like all of yeah, that, exactly. right? So um, that was, that was kind of the, the, the initial step. And, and, once you get to a certain point, you're like, there's this, this really works. Um, we, we kind of pitched it to Oakland, like the, the Oaklands and they really loved it. And so uh, they agreed to let us have every single project in the company start with a tax plan, at least wow. for communication. Right. And so that's what, at least when I left and I'm not I'm not affiliated with that that group anymore, so I can't speak for them. But that's what we were doing, and and that's the initiative that I helped to to drive forward. Me and a a, a number of other people, J Jason Schroeder being one of them. Lee Peterson was another uh, really uh, influential person, and we we uh, we saw so much uh, returns on just simply being able to communicate better that it was like there's something here, and we didn't understand it at the time that there's so much more and. Uh, we ended up, long story short, connecting with some folks out of Germany, uh, Dr. Janosch Dooley and Marco Benner. They're the foremost leading experts in tact planning in the world. They have their PhDs in tact in construction. Um, they, uh, they're both their theses came out these Thesis is that a, is that, a, is that who said Thesai? It? I don't know. Thesai, right? <laughs> Whatever the multiple None of us are thesis fine. is, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but both of them have individual uh, individual thesis on tax planning that came out this last year. And um, we ended up visiting them in Germany to learn more. And they, they have created a whole um, physical simulation to show how tax works really well in construction, how to, how to, manage and control because there is a, a level of control that is needed on a project site or else things could kill you right so it's like at mm. least from a safety standpoint there's a there's a level of control uh the problem i think in the past is it's been command and control where it's like there's a level of control but like not like a top down like do what i say damn it type control is is needed on on construction which is kind of the archaic past right so mm -hmm. um they, they showed us the this whole other side of tact that we were unaware of, uh, the production laws and and how manufacturing ha has used things like Little's Law, Kingman's Formula, the Law of Bottlenecks, the Theory of Constraints, all these things that have really kind of been created and nurtured and, and studied and reviewed and peer-reviewed and, and of, in a very scientific way like their, their laws, just like any scientific law, you know, it can be disproved, but you know, to this point, it's like, it's almost just undeniable. And these things, if you apply them to construction, uh, it's crazy the amount of efficiency that you can gain. When I, when I visited Marco in Karlsruhe, uh, a, a city in Germany, he, he showed me a building 
and uh, it's multifamily. You know, bottom floor is is uh, is uh, concrete construction, then wood uh, wood framing from there up. Very standard type construction nowadays, right? There's there's a lot of that going around. I think the world um, and same number of units, same style of construction, same exteriors, basically. If if you wanted an apples to apples comparison of what I had built in Utah versus what they were building in Germany, this was it. This was the same building. Mm. Took me over 15 months. They did it in five and a half. Wow. A third of the freaking time. And I was like, no, no. I was like, show me. Like, do it. Like, and I started like, I was like, I don't believe you. Like, this is bulk. Like, what did you, like, there's some trick here. He's like, no, it took us 15 years to figure out how to get to this point. Tomorrow, mm-hmm. you can't start doing this. And he started showing me how they completely uh, dismantled their supply chains and rebuilt them to be able to s- support that type of system and to be able to, to use prefabrication, not just as like a gimmick, like what we're using a lot of it today, right? It's, it's more gimmicky. It's like, oh yeah, this can help us, but we use it like one like major component of a building, but we're not really like prefab, like we're not using it. We're not assembling buildings. We're still stick framing buildings but we're not assembling buildings, but that's what they're mm-hmm. doing. Like that's, that's the path they're on. And Yana, she told me when we were in, in uh, Munich, he was like, so we've, we've been teaching training tact for 15 years. And in Germany, 60% plus of construction is now all done in tact planning because we have these gains and for everybody else to stay competitive, they've all had to switch. But that's the, the, the crazy thing is that it's not catching on everywhere. Like it's not mm-hmm. like the thing right now. And so it's like, well, why is that? Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. And it's, it's easier to control that type of, um, you know, change a whole, so, like think about trying to change the global supply chain market. Like that's, that almost sounds insurmountable, but within mm. like their own sphere, they did it. And it shows that it's possible. Is it probable that we do that for the entire industry? I don't know the path to do that, but I've seen the principles and how they can improve the efficiency of construction and tested it myself and on many different types of construction. And it works. It works at various levels of different types of construction, but the principles still work. And that's the crazy thing is that we've been so focused on project management versus product management like what are we Mm -hmm. actually building and how is that process actually going and are we tracking how that is going and making adjustments or do we just keep doing the same things over and over again and i don't know how it is in the uk for you uh (laughs) dale i don't know how it is in us for australia for you val but if there's one motto in the construction industry it's that that's just the way we've always done it yeah and that right there I think is the big antithesis to why this is not caught on or why other tools, it doesn't have to be tech, like whatever it is that makes us better. That's the antithesis to growth. And that's why construction is behind in a lot of ways, whether it's, you know, digitalization or, you know, BIM or any Mm -hmm. of these things that, that we, that we see now. I mean, this is not new stuff. Like this is all stuff from decades ago that we're just barely starting to apply to construction because of that one motto and that one slogan that we sadly have in our industry. So anyway, I know that yeah. I don't want to ramble on for too long before I give you, let you guys. Get no, we, voices, so. we love it. We love it. And um, look, I, I mean, I can speak in some, some areas of Australia, but it, it is the same. I think we get into this, uh, we get into this, I think the trick is the client needs to uh, really drive what they want. And unfortunately, I think for a lot of our clients here, they don't know what they don't know. And a lot of the times it's easy to go with, you know, better, better the devil, you know, so, well, I know we have people and I think you've got basically an economy built around a certain way of delivering projects, even if that way doesn't deliver the successful outcomes you want. So we've got a whole enterprise. There's a, there's a whole infrastructure around training people in P6 and delivering CPM. And by the way, I'm not shooting down CPM. There are, I think there are projects that it's really useful for, and it's a good application as a type. But I think depending on the type of project and contract in place and supply chain, we should be able to have conversations where we go, well, here's a scorecard. Here's a style for that. Here's, here's what you need. I think, I think Adele and I had done something similar around, you know, weighted scorecards. If you had an idea 
And I think we talked to some software companies like Alice and Mplan. If you could be deterministic and you say, well, I've got these kind of parameters, these constraints, these amount of people, and you pump in all the information. And we, we see this is where future of, of basically these plat planning platforms are going. Then it, it spits out the, AI the recommendations, spits out the, yeah, the canvas you should use, thing, the types. Yeah. yeah, Little's Law, Theory of Constraints would be really useful, obviously, from a production perspective. Then you might need a little bit of agile here. You'll definitely need some hard, hard logic here. So I, I think we're getting to a point where hopefully that's all on the buffet of planning and we can just pick and choose. But if you went to a planner today, and again, this is a personal experience, they would have a very limited repertoire of what they actually use. They might know about these other things, but because they're kind of constrained by the, the powers that be, the, this is the command and control Spencer, very limited in, in what they can actually execute. So even though they know what the, what good is, you know, they know what the right medicine to take is, but they won't. They'll, they'll go down the same route of, well, this is how we're going to do it in construction. So from my experience, it's the same. I don't know, Dale, if you had the same experience in the UK. Yeah, I, I think um, you, you're right in what you're saying in terms of Oz and, and what's happening in the UK as well, because it, it, it almost falls, Spencer, into that too difficult box. As soon as you try to explain something new, a new concept, a new idea, you know, you just talk about data analytics, you know, something that to perhaps us is, uh, you know, something that makes sense to those that have never heard it before. It's a bit scary. It's that, you know, fight or flight. And basically yeah. they, they mm. fight it or they fly away from it. They don't actually yeah. embrace it. And so it, it's quite difficult to win over hearts and minds when it comes to this. And you're right. It comes back to what you're saying. It's, this is the way we've always done it. And it's, it's interesting because, you, you, you go into how, you know, you, you mentioned how tact is scientific. And a lot of what we do, if you think about um, scheduling just in general, if you just use, you know, the one we know and love, CPM methodology, forward, backward, it's formula, it's mathematics, it's statistics, it's numbers. And for a lot of people, that's actually quite scary if you think about it. But then when you put it in a pretty Gantt or something that looks good and they can understand and bring it to life, then all of a sudden, oh, that's great. And I used to say, Val and I we used to discuss this a lot. You can have the best theoretical schedule in Primavera, you know, for the four or five year project that you want into the most granular detail and might be the perfect schedule. But if no one looks at it, what is the actual point? Yet, to borrow the UK or British phrase, on the back of a fag pack, you can write down a few lines and say, this is what we're doing. And if everyone believes in that plan written down on the back of that fag pack, they will execute it because they believe in it and they see it, right? So we have a big role to play in bringing schedules, planning to life. And I think Part of it is the education, and that's one of the major motivations in, in the similar vein to, to what um, you're doing. It's what we want to do with this podcast is to share and enlighten people to, hey, mm -hmm. there's other things out there. There's not only this one way. Um, but I want to just bring it back slightly to tact and ask you around some of the trials, tribulations, and successes of implementation, bringing this to a new client or customer. Um, how you went about it, you know, what are the, some of the the key benefits that you would highlight to them, um, but also, you know, some of the challenges you found when it came to to winning those hearts and minds. Do you start with a visualization? Do you start with look? These are projects that have been implemented and the results. We, you know, money talks at the end of the day. Do you show them, you know, this versus that? Can we truly say this mm. versus that? Because projects are unique. There's that whole debate. Um, so a whole host of questions packaged into that box. I just wonder if you can unpack that for us. Uh, yeah, and um, so. I think it's all of the above and it depends on the person too. So it's like, you can try to sell the same way to a different person that you might, you, you know, you might've sold to one owner and they're like, oh yeah, totally bought into it. I could see the vision. And you do that same exact thing with a different owner, but they're a different person, right? They come from different experiences, different backgrounds. I think reading that room and reading that person and understanding what is important to them. Cause it might be, you know, this project will go smoothly and we won't have a ton of RFIs. Like he, I don't care. I want it to be less costly or I want it to, you know, I don't mm. want any safety issues, like whatever their thing is. Right. Or, you know, they might not have that, you know, intuition to know what they want. Like Val was talking earlier. It's like, they don't know what they don't know. And so it's like, 
well, that's kind of the reason why they're coming to us. Like we're supposedly the experts, right? As a, a general contractor or, or tertiary counsel or some sort of, you know, consultant or someone that's come in as an expert, right? As someone from project controls or understanding program or project scheduling, it's like, it's our responsibility to cut through that minutia and give them that aha moment that they can see, like you're, like you brought up, um, Dale, where it's, you know, we might understand those data analytics, but once you compile it into a visual that they can then see it's light bulb goes on because that's how they communicate. They might be a visual learner and, and uh, just understand things better when they're, you know, compiled into easily understood information um, visually. So um, it, it's, it's, all, it's all of the above and it depends. Um, usually just in the visualization, people are like, oh, I'm sold. Like I can, like you can fit, I, I don't know the, an exact number and I haven't really done this. It's probably like 10,000 X of what you can fit on a single sheet within a, a Primavera normal a Gantt chart CPM type report, right? Where you would print off a, you know, a full schedule, you know, hundreds of pages of, of lines that, you know, represent a whole network of, of stuff, but like really compiling that down into something smaller. It's like, well, you have level of effort bars or you could, well, how else could you do it? Well, you can show logic lines, but then it just looks like black like darkness because like all the lines come up and they're all over each other it's like well that doesn't work i remember telling yeah. someone early on in my career it's like whoever can like crack the code on like visualizing those logic lines better like they're gonna be a billionaire like they're like mm. figuring that out like that is like key and that is actually something that tech does better i don't know if it's like perfect but like it helps to visualize you see the sequential pattern of this, 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 it cuts out start to start to starts and lags. And which um, I don't know if y'all have this belief. I know there's some debate out there that the golden, the golden relationship is the finish to start. It's, it's the best in my opinion. And that's what like makes it super simple is you package things in a way where you don't have to have that start to start relationship. It's just defining something else that you're doing. It's some sort of subtask or in some different work area. Like there's, there's only a certain number of criteria, in my opinion, of why those different relationships are ever needed uh, or realistic in, in forecasting work and what really happens. And you can, if you define work areas, work breakdown structures, or whatever you want to call them, zones, uh, the, the uh, location uh, basis of your actual schedule, if you define that in a way where everything becomes a finish to start then you have a very understandable uh, schedule because it's sequential one after another. And then you see that one thing that is repeatable between different areas, how that all, if you find a way to level and get things work packaged correctly, that is repeatable, you know, do drywall in this area, then go do, do drywall in that area, paint in this area, paint in that area. And that's a very simple, a simplified, uh, you know, version of it. But that that's kind of the concept is you're doing that um, over time and applying those, uh, those processes and, and theories to construction. I hope, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, no, how do you, no. how do you sell folks on it? And, <laughs> and, and it could come from the, from the cost, uh, analysis we've, we've done, um, work with many folks across the world and showing them, okay, let's take a scenario, um, or scenario <laughs> and, uh, apply it with, you know, a traditional, uh, work breakdown structure. And let's take a smaller batch size and more, you know, using a little bit of Little's Law and, and let's take a smaller batch size and compare those of how that works with the same production rates, taking a, a duration of, of one activity within a work breakdown structure and whatever that smaller batch size and breaking that work breakdown structure into more and seeing what that production looks like and being able to start things sooner. And that's the, that's the thing that really happens. When you take an activity, let's take drywall, for instance, and maybe I go to visuals at this point because I'm trying to like visualize with my fingers. But uh, when you take something like drywall and it's 20 days and then paint comes after it, let's say it's 10 days. Well, that's in a 10,000 10, square foot area. Well, if, if you break that in half, now you have 5,000 square feet. Well, 
that duration of drywall, depending if you're talking about taping and muddy and you're waiting on dry times, like there might be some of that in there, but let's say it's just cut in half because your, your area is cut in half. And let's say that dry times still work out. So that, that works out. Well, that 20 day or the, yeah, that 20 day duration for drywall. Well, now it's 10 in this area and 10 in that area. So when you're done in this area with drywall, the drywaller moves all of his tooling, all of his, all of his material, all of his equipment there while the painter moves into that first 5,000 square feet and the drywaller's here for 10 days and the painter's mm -hmm. here for 10 days. Now I know the paint was 10 days in, in the initial, but he had a three-man crew. Let's cut him to a two-man crew. His efficiency goes down, but it meets that tack time, right? So now they're going at the same rate and every time that they move, they move together, right? The drywaller moves to that next area and then the painter moves into the one that he was just in. And that's how that efficiency begins is you have that starting of the paint starting earlier, thus the end pulls in. And so when you take those scenarios and you're saying, okay, Mr. Owner, here's your traditional schedule. Here's an optimized with tack planning. What would you rather? And he's looking at a three month difference. I mean, mm. yeah. What do you want to do, Mr. Owner? And he's like, well, yeah. obviously this one. It's like, there you go. Now, Mr. Owner, we want to use that three months as a contingency. We're going to hold on to it. We're targeting that three month earlier range. And at latest, we're going to deliver it here. It's almost like you don't even have to do a risk analysis to prove uh, how much, you know, you have it baked in just by using production laws and bringing that time in because you're taking everyone's production and aligning them and being able to make them more efficient by having more areas. That's that in a nutshell is, is, is tax planning. So, um, Anyway, I'll, 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 I'll stop talking and let you let you. No, no, <laughs> I, I love it. We'll we'll let you go on. Um, but no, it, I love it because you productionizing project management basically, um, or project delivery. The thing that um, I want to jump into is the visualization. I know it's difficult because we we mainly audio on podcasts, although we do have the YouTube. So maybe this will drive people to to watch the YouTube because you've got a fantastic background behind you there. Um, but before we jump into the visualization. I just want to ask quickly, is it purely construction at this stage in terms of project management, or have you seen other sectors that have adopted TACT and that TACT well, lends itself to? Yes, uh, actually TACT more is correlated with manufacturing. And sure. it's actually we actually do it in a reverse method where we plan TACT and then try to execute the flow. They produce stuff and then they calculate what their flow is. So it's almost there like historical and we're using it as a, how do we get better flow and how do we, what is our actual production? Mm -hmm. Like that, it's kind of the two different um, sides of the coin. It cut, they start, they've started uh, by using tact to just calculate what their outcome is. What is our throughput of goods, right? How many pens, how many pens per hour are we producing? How many books per hour can we print? You know, those types of things. How many cars can we produce per day right. or per minute or whatever it is, right? And that production rate is based on all of the different processes within a sink. And maybe it's multiple line, but let's, let's boil it down to something simple. A singular line production assembly, if they figure that out, then they know every single station's average tact time. So every 20 seconds, they get a pen out. That means that every 10 stations has so many seconds, right? So they know what each process needs to at least hit, or now we know how to figure out what's holding us up because we might have a station that can produce a lot faster than that. And now we can identify what our bottlenecks are of production. It's like, okay, this one right here takes five seconds, but the whole process takes 20, okay but we have 10 stations. We know that's our bottleneck. So how do we improve that? Yeah. We improve that mm -hmm. it improves the whole and we can really produce more. And we've never thought like that in construction. That's the crazy thing is we've never thought in a, we're producing something. And it's because we're in such a different environment. There's, there's a lot more um, issues with construction. It's not as simple. Uh, you know, usually in manufacturing, they contract the, the labor is all in-house. The tooling is all in-house. The 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 whole everything is all in-house. Versus in construction, it's usually subcontracted out to many different people. And how do you align all these different people that have never worked together into a system that produces well? It's it's kind of like we're setting ourselves up for failure. <laughs> but um, mm. that that there are so many nuances between manufacturing and construction. So like I that's where I started when 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 this whole thing 
like wh when I started to dive into lean and, and some of these principles, it's like, this does not apply to construction. Like it's, it's not the same thing. We're not in a warehouse. Like how do you deal with weather when you get slammed with snow in the middle of your like assembly line? What do you do then? Like what, show me your lean practice for that. Like, you know, I was, I came from that like very skeptical side. Right. And, and then actually trying, it's like, well, yeah, it's not perfect, but there's something here. Like there's some, there's some underlying like principles that like we really could like use. <laughs> and so like, don't throw the baby with out with the bathwater type thing. It's it's uh, it's been a, a real ordeal. Um, I'd like to share um, uh, my screen if we wanted to go into the visualization. Yeah, no, absolutely. If you could, I mean, while you while you're busy sharing your screen there, I think I, you know I, I had a quick look you know ahead of the, this recording, and um, you know you got you got columns, you got rows, you got colors um, as as a basic sort of foundation. Of, of what you're seeing um, but since I know absolutely next to nothing about it I'll hand over to you to kind of take us through what those rows what those columns what those colors actually mean um, and we'll do our best for our audio listeners to explain what we're looking at perfect so uh, just really quick um, here's a uh, what a tack fund might look like um, you have row. I mean, this is an Excel. There's nothing. And that's the first thing that like mm. led me away from tech plan. I was like, Excel, really? Like I'm coming from like one of the, the hardest softwares to learn out there. <laughs> and like, we're going back to Excel. Like, what are we doing here? So um, uh, the rows represent the geographical locations. Usually with this type of a schedule, you'll see some sort of location chart like a, like a plan view or map of here's this area defined like this tact zone as you see it right here this might be the first area and it might be pink and then the that or you know it doesn't have to be colored but you you know that's a really well defined space right and you know everything that happens within that space and then adjacent to it or maybe not uh, you have a different zone and so you see all of your different zones and those correlate with that map or those sets of maps to show you what these areas mean. So you can see that what we call logistical flow. And so you see this top uh, top down arrow. So you're going from this area to this area, to this er or zone, right? To this zone, to this zone, all the way down. And so however many zones, if you have 10 different areas or 10 different zones, whatever you want to call them, those geographical locations become that uh, uh, X, that's, a, that's the X axis, right? That's your X axis. So location, right? And then time, obviously there's a, a traditional time scale up here. And this is this is one of the typical things that you'll see. This is a, a weekly uh, tack time, meaning that this cell right here, this December 3rd, that's the Monday of that December of, of 2018, right? So that's the Monday. The next Monday is the 10th. So each one of these blocks represents a five-day work week. If that's the work week you're working in, or maybe it's a four-day work week. Hopefully we're not working six-day work weeks anymore. Uh, we really want to have good work-life balance. So I'm not promoting that. Anyway, so that's the idea is that you're seeing the, the intersection of time and space. That is a difference between CPM. Because in CPM, we see the intersection of activity and, and time. So what mm. activities are we doing in a certain time? But we see more with attack plan. So we have our first logistical flow. Let's talk about workflow. So you see the uh, hor the horizontal axis here. As we come across, you see the numbering one, two, three, four, right? So on and so forth, all the way to 13. Usually in an Excel type version of, of, of TACT, you'll have some sort of legend that shows you the different scopes of work. And I say scopes, with an S meaning multiple, because you could have multiple things going on at, at a certain time. Just like we know, maybe it's a start start relationship and you have a, maybe you're trimming uh, out your, your electrical, you know, uh, cover plates and switches and stuff like that. And the HVAC guy's coming in and he's doing his cover plates for the, for the vents. And those happen at the same time, generally the same duration. So let's just do a start start and it's a uh, whatever duration, right? Those can be work packaged compiled together into one of these numbers or maybe a bunch of these numbers or maybe they're separate but those that's how you package that work together so that you can have that repeatable okay do those cover plates in this area then move on and do those cover plates in this area and then this area in this area and now you're seeing that workflow over time which is the 
trade flow. So you can automatically see three types of flow, your logistical flow, which is from zone to zone to zone to zone. So you know how the work is moving through that space. Maybe this is level one of building and you have these 10 areas and you know how that work is, you know, where you're starting, where you're finishing. You're working from the stairway all the way over to the elevator or however it works for, for whatever, right? That's that logistical flow, that logistics flow. And then the workflow, that's the sequential order of scope to be done, right? Uh, drywall, paint, finish it, like that, that type of order, right? So you have that workflow. And then trade flow, this is the flow the trades use of work from area to area to area by work package or by wagon. Um, that's the general gist of how to read and understand a tax plan. So you can see, I mean, how many? There's 13 work packages that might represent 50 different activities in, in P6 over 10 different uh, WBS structures. You're talking 30 pages right here, that big, easily understood. Mm. So right there, like usually when I show people this, so like, ooh, we can take P6 or CPM and do this. Like I, that's what I spent you know, the first part of my like tact understanding was like, how do I get P6? Like, how do I play with the bars in order to like color them so that I can collapse everything and then show all of this just to get this. And it takes, a, it takes some time and, and maybe you could make some layouts and different things that, you know, you don't have to rebuild those again. So you just have it, but there's a lot of time and effort that really, I mean, within 20 minutes, I can build out a pretty decent sized project in Excel with tech. <laughs> like it's not even like I was a fast P6 user. And I was like, I like kind of prided myself. I was like, I know like all these tricks. And I, I even had like programmed things in my mouse that like hot keys that are like crazy, like how to link relationships. Like I was, I was in it. Right. I was, I, I thought I, I was, I was good. And uh, I was like, there's no way I could be faster in Excel than how I am in, in P6. And it's, it's not even, it's not even close. You can, anyone can can go faster than I was in p6 in um, in Excel so that's the gist of the of the visualization of tact is that you have a common duration a common time frame and that comes from leveling work which we're familiar with in, in project controls that's a, I mean that's even a function in p6s leveling resources right in production and durations right so we're but used you to never that. press it you never press the button <laughs> right right. <laughs> But that th those concepts aren't necessarily thrown out. We need to apply them in a certain way so that you can actually get, how do you get this type of production? Maybe it's not 100% achievable. Maybe one through eight all can be tacted really nice. And maybe nine through 13 are on a different production rate. And maybe it's not the same duration. Maybe it's a different duration, but nine through 13 can be grouped together as a tacked kind of flow. So you see this all together and people think of this as, Tact. This is this probably most likely is not the entire project, because you have you have much different systems. Like if you're talking about like structural versus like rough in or like finishes or exteriors or site, like all these kind of different major time frames within a within a project life cycle. You there's different processes and different things. So this might represent one of those phases, or it might be a a, a portion of those phases, or it might be a certain location or type of, of locations through a building. It might be all the exam rooms within a hospital and you might compile all those into a certain, you know, type of tax zoning and, and have that through the whole hospital and then have, have that be your, what we call a tax phase. And I think that's causing some confusion is, you know, construction phase or phasing of, of a project. It's, it's much different. It's kind of your sequential flow that can be grouped together and work together as a system is kind of what a, a tax phases some people call it attack train so if if you can have all the same like legend here and it works all together you that that one train is repeatable from station to station to station so you see how the train is moving um and if if you want to if you want to see a fascinating video on uh the old youtube channel i was affiliated with lean tact uh, jason uh, dives into how the flow actually is not uh uh left to right like you see here and it's not the train moving across the screen. It's actually working down. And I won't go into it, but this whole thing starts on day one and then day two or uh, tack time 
here and then here and then here. And as, as you see it, that one is coming down and twos are coming down. It's fascinating how he was able to visualize that's actually what, ha what happens is your train moves down through the logistical flow. It's really, really interesting. So you can see that because it's going down and a downward here and it's moving uh, to the right in time. So your train is moving down as the scale moves across. It's, re it's really interesting as you can start to visualize these things. But the crazy thing that once you get here, is this is a geometric shape. So algebra and geometry really apply to this thing. And so that's where Little's law comes in. So you can take um, you can take the amount of taxons you have, the amount of wagons or work, work package numbers that you have and uh, your tack time, and you can figure out how many zones you should have um, and find an optimization of that. And so that's, that's where you can take that production and really get, uh, uh, with the same speed of production, but with more zones, you can optimize and go faster overall, but everyone still goes the same amount of, of speed. Um, I wonder if we have a, a, an image here that I can show of an optimization example. Yeah, right here, like this, right? So you, so you can clearly see here, this, this maroon number one, goes from day one to day five, right? It also goes all the way to day 10. But uh, the crazy thing is this production of whatever this activity or task is that takes 25 days to, to, to do with, what is that, five zones? If you do the same amount of work, but break it up into 13 zones, you can give the trades or this contractor or whoever this is 26 days. So you're giving them more days so you see number one, yeah, more days, and it's done on day 40 versus day 60. That's mm. just Little's Law. It's taking your space and breaking up smaller, but you still have the same production rate. It's actually a bit slower because you have 26 days to do the same amount of work. Your spaces are defined smaller, though, where this might be a larger area, and thus you have five days of work. You have a smaller area with only two days of work. And so that first, you know, one area is broken up into one and a half areas, right? And that's that's really where the magic comes in is let's say that you're going to have an issue with one of your one of your activities and you don't know it until you're there and installing it. You're like, crap, this doesn't apply, like this mastic doesn't stick to whatever we didn't do a mock-up or whatever it was. Let's say it's number six here. Six up here, you're gonna start on day 26 versus back here, you're starting on day 11. You're going to find your issues so much quicker and be able to fix them. Let's say that you still have the same amount of issues and they still push you the same amount of time. Well, now you have 20 days worth of buffer built in that mm. you can combat those things with. And this is this to me is a much better mathematical model to be scheduling and forecasting work with because it's proactive versus reactive. Float is a reactive, how bad did we suck and what do we have to do? Or what are the things that we have to focus on, right? But that can change, right? Our critical path can change. And then it's like, okay, we're shifting our focus from here to here. Now what? And now what, right? Versus this is very proactive where you can see, okay, if I'm starting this on day 11, I want to find those issues and I'm going to hold on to this extra time that I found. And that's what I suggest to do is not just dump that to the owner and say, yeah, we, we promised that we could do it in 40 days. No, let's stop. Let's stop thinking that way. Let's, this is, this is a, this is a highly volatile production um, that can have things go wrong. And if they do, it's moving to the right. And, and some, some people uh, use these, uh, these standards, like you guys had, had brought up, you know, we don't always feel like we can, uh, mostly at least in the US because it's contractual. You have to use CPM and you are required to use CPM. Mm. And you know, maybe that's the case. And that's where that's where we started at Oakland. It's like, okay, if we have to provide X, that's fine. We're going to provide you with X, but we're going to build with Y. We're going to do this and then we'll update what is happening on the job site to you with this thing. But we're using this other tool. It's a means and methods. Like we're using this as a as a as a means to produce work faster, uh, more efficient, safer, higher quality, catching those things, giving us the time. Like if, if, and I can almost, I can almost guarantee this to anyone that I talk to. It's like, 
if I could give your trades more time, get done way faster, and have your stress level come down, would, would do you feel like that is snake oil that I'm selling? And I was like, yeah, that sounds too good to be true. It's not. It's simple production law math that can apply to construction if you figure out your sequence and a common time frame that you can uh, align your leveled production. And that that's the, that's the key there. Everyone sees this and it's like, construction's not like that. My, 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 the activities in my WBS breakdown structure could never look like that. And that's a false assumption. Yeah, that's what I, I thought the first time I saw it. I was like, there's no way that's anything but a hotel or something that's super repeatable. Like there's no way. Mm-hmm. There's no yeah. way, but yeah, that, that, right. that's, that's the, that's the barrier to get to getting the types of outcomes that, that we can and have achieved with tax planning and construction um, is getting over that. Well, we can't, well, how could we, and how close to it could we get? Maybe it's not perfect, but the closer you get to it, the more of this type of, of efficiency you can gain. No, absolutely, Spencer. And thanks for taking us through that. And, you know, those folks that are listening, go check it out on on YouTube if you can't quite picture what we're looking at. But I can certainly see while you're talking there, I was I was I was trying to think of some of the, you know, the 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 arguments of, oh, we can do this in CPM, we can do this in P6. And I was answering those by, well, actually, this is just far easier to consume for those that don't understand the complexity of Primavera and logic, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a hugely powerful visualization. Um, This is where I go to Val and say, Val, have you been convinced that uh, Excel has still got value on projects? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think there's there's other tools to do it in. But I think if you're I think if you're proving a point, I think well, one thing I like about Excel is it's quick and easy, right? If you're, yep. it's a malleable tool that you can you can prove something mathematically. So this is what it is, and then once you've done that and you want to build for scale, you have to get off that. It's not built for scale at all. <laughs> I agree. Um, I 100% agree with that. Yeah, I, I had a question about this in rela- in relation to, I guess the assumption behind this is that it's early as possible, right? All of these um, activities, if you're moving to an optimized view. You're trying to do them by breaking them up into smaller, let's call them zones from my primitive mind. Then the idea is that they're they're on the earliest possible kind of line. Is that right? Uh, kind of. Yeah. Um, yes and no. Um, okay. It's not just slam everything to the left because then you have a high likelihood of it pushing to the right. Well, that's my concern. Um, I was going to ask you, yeah, how do you... How do you deal with that? How's that? So maybe the better question to ask Spencer is, so how do you go about this? Let's say we've got some listeners out there that go, Spencer's awesome. I love his energy. I need, <laughs> I need a Spencer in my project. I don't have one, but how can I get a bit of a plan together? Where do they start? Uh, start by asking questions. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not naive to think, I'm not naive enough to think that I have solved the world's problem, <laughs> but there is something here and it's not just me. Yeah. There's, a, there's a whole community um, researching, testing, continuing this work. And it's not just like some guys in their basement. There's, I don't know if you've ever heard of the IGLC, the International um, uh, Group for Lean Construction. They, they, they do scientific papers only based in data, not an opinion. And I'm more of an opinion guy. I've tested it and I'm telling you my opinion. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more boots on the ground. I'm a contractor. I'm a builder. I'm not, I'm not a academic, but there are academics focused on this in the engineering and uh, production uh, side of construction that are focused on this. And a lot of the stuff um, that I'm showing you are all derivatives from stuff that they've learned years ago. And we're trying to help spread that in the industry and say, Hey, this really does work you try it out. Like, don't, don't take my word for it. Try to do X, Y, or Z. And the, and the big thing, um, Val, to your point, um, you know, <clears throat> it's not just slamming everything to the left because that would be idiotic. So how do we, how do we adjust that? Well, you just now have, I just showed you in one little phase of a project, how, how I can give you 20 days. Well, mm-hmm. now it's, how do we take that 20 days and really manage it properly? Don't just throw it at the end because if you're telling contractor six to be there on day 11, and it's highly likely he's not going to be there on day 11 because you're going to have issues. So how do you insert that 20 days of buffer properly so that they can have that same production rate, but you're inserting it into um, 
into the tech plan. And that's a big thing that I promote is we have to understand that a, a schedule, a forecast without buffers is destined to just be absolutely wrong because we live in, in the real world, not in the theoretical world where you just say, this takes five days, that takes 100 days, it's 105 days. It's like, mm, something's going to happen in there. Something's going to come into work sick. Like, so, like mm. something's going to go on. There's some sort of risk involved there. And there has to be some sort of, whether you call it contingency or buffer, and we have to take that into account somehow. And that that somehow is a whole, I think, art form. And once you start to look at this in a, in a production sense, now it opens up a lot of, of, of venues of how can you, how can you do that? And, and instead of diving deep in, into the buffer management, um, I'll, I'll point you back to the book. We outline this fairly well in, in, our, in our book, uh, Tech Planning and Integra Integrated Control. Um, really interesting read. We do a bit of C, uh, CPM bashing, but I'm I'm more on on board with what what you guys said earlier. I don't necessarily want to dictate to someone use tact because it's better. I want it to be a, a a shelf of tools, and we can decide which tool we want to use. And that's just not how how our industry is right now. And if we can get to that point, I think we'll be in a lot better position because maybe there is a a project that makes sense to use CPM. I think that contractor, that group, that, that company, those folks, they should be able to decide to do that. Just like we should be able to decide to do last planner, scrum, tact, whatever it is, right? We should be able to, to decide our means and methods and tools of how to manage the project. I'll leave you with one last thing. I know, I know we're running short on time and I know we have a, a bit of an ending, but this was, this was one thing that um, really kind of put the nail in the coffin for me. And I challenge everybody that's listening to do this on your project. Um, take your raw data and put it in location by time. And there are, there are tools out there. Uh, shout out to those uh, great folks that are doing that. I think that's a great step in a good direction of visualization and communication. Um, uh, you could put links to their stuff. Uh, you know, there's, there's a number of them and, and, you know, very different uses. But there, there, there is... There is truth to this. Anytime that you take a C, anytime that I found that you take a CPM schedule and you put it into location by time, you'll see something like this or like this or mm -hmm. like this. And the one thing you don't see is how in the hell a trade partner, subcontractor is going to come to the job site and make money on a schedule based like this. Or like this, like does this mean that they have more people right here and they have to ramp up? But what happens if something pushes? Is does this mean there's what is this one, two, three, four? Is that four crews? And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine crews. Is that really what is happening? And and you know a lot of folks will be like, well, if you really used CPM correctly and you actually did resource management, you, it's like, yeah, the majority of construction doesn't. The vast majority of construction doesn't because they don't have the funds to fund people like us to do that. This is what construction looks like today. Mm -hmm. And we're just so showing take the your uh, yeah. take your project and put it in location by time. Find a yeah. group of of activities group them together, put a color on it and see if there's any flow. This is the best and it looks horrible. This is the best I found. And it looks, in my opinion, gosh awful. And yeah, as, it's, tra it's as trades, I've, I've heard folks tell me with using tact, they've made the most money that they've ever made on a project. Because if you think about it, their guys move from area to area to area, uninterrupted flow from start to finish. Now it's not perfect. It's not rainbows. It's not unicorns, but this is the focus of tax planning is how do we create flow? How do we let the trade get there, do their work, flow through all of it and get out of there? That's how they make money. And if we're focused on that, they'll make money, which means we make money. And this is, this has been going on for a very, very long time. Tax planning was used. And I, I told you, I'd show you. Tax planning was used with the empire state building. This is, great to see, yeah. A yeah, very early, this is basically line of balance. 
but it's a production rate. And they actually talked about how they adjusted some mm. of these so that you can get a similar production, which is what tax planning does. And you can see their area breakouts here. It's great to see all these like hand-drawn pencil, like drafted, like schedules yeah. and like charts, right? And you can see the flow of their work. Like this is what happened. And um, the same type of thing, they used it. Uh, I don't know if I can find it quick. They used it in um, the Pentagon renovation. It's actually, where is it? Where is it? It's this, this is the schedule. I have the maps too. I don't know where, where they are on this, on this mural board. But this is the Pentagon renovation that uh, Hensel Phelps did. They call it a SIPS, a short interval uh, uh, schedule. And it's the same principles though. Like what are your different blocks of things and get them on that similar flow and, and get to work. So that wow. I hope in a nutshell has helped sum up what it is and kind of the application and some of the things of what we see out there. Um, yeah. There you go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lots of visual uh, cues there. So for those that uh, didn't see what we were looking at, you can go to YouTube. Uh, but I think the, the 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 premise of it at least is is it's visually appealing and understandable. Two, it's it's logic flow and process without the logic lines. So you haven't got a plethora of black, which you'll get if you try and look at 30,000 lines on a P6 program. Um, some of the takeaways as well is the assumption that, um, you know, you need to break these things out further to to basically optimize them and use resources as well. Because I think one of the other challenges we have, Spencer, is not a lot of these programs are resource loading or at least the clients aren't requiring them to. And this is a very, very concerning point because if you're trying to status or progress, and if you don't know how many people we got on the ground doing the work, uh, and like you said, someone takes a sickie or, you know, God forbid COVID, then, then this changes the schedule completely. Um, and usually we always find out after the fact as well, one of the real annoying points, um, which I wanted to ask you, how long does it take to update? Because statusing a program is one of the biggest annoyances, I think, in scheduling, <laughs> and schedulers can tell me, um, because a lot of the time things have already happened. We've we've gone past the point of, of being able to control the change. Now we're dealing with the, well, shit, what are we doing for the rest of the program to, to mitigate <laughs> now, this? Now what, right? <laughs> yeah, now what? So what's your view on, on just that from a statusing progress perspective? How does, how does that work in the tax world? Fraction of the time and can be done by anybody. Um, th there's various levels of that. If you start out and you're in Excel, you're not gonna have the robustness of a system, right? Uh, mm. the, if, if Go to YouTube so you can see my background, uh, but my background is tacting. Um, if you type in T-A-K-T-I-N-G.com, um, it's a free, yep, free tact. Uh, it's actually, uh, uh, Janos and Marco, the guys in Germany, they're the ones that are making it and they want it to just be the next thing. So they're like, we don't care what it is. We don't want to make money on it. Here it is for free. So Excel and tacting both free. So tax is basically free to the industry, at least right now. Um, but using Excel, uh, I, I had a, a gentleman who was a 58 year old superintendent who knew how to speak to a scheduler and update a schedule, but had never touched P6. And our updates took anywhere from three to six hours, depending on what happened that, you know, it's, it kind of varied size of project was like a hundred million dollar, like hospital build. Right. So it was kind of that, that, uh, that size. And we started implementing tact and he took over updating the schedule and it took him 30 minutes. Wow. 30 minutes. Now that could, I'm not promising that for everybody. Like that, the, there were some sure. cir circumstances there, and he got really amped and fired up about it. And he, like, I would come, and it was more like me walking and being like, "Are you doing it right?" Like I was, it was more like my project controls hat was still on, and I didn't have to do any button clicks, and it was super easy. And then we started focusing on lean implementation, not just like, "Did this task end on this day?" No, it didn't. Crap. Now what do we do? Let's link it to something. You know, it's, it wasn't that like, it was, we, we didn't spend time doing that. We spent time like thinking about, okay, how do we get these guys into this space with their equipment faster? Like, let's talk about that. Cause if we can do that, we stay on tack time better. So let's look at their actual like carts and how are their carts actually moving? And what's, what's the hold up there? And Oh, it's them putting their tool. Okay. Well, if we made better bins here and you could put your tools in faster, not just throw them in. Like it's those things that actually increased our production, not 
did you know not button clicking it like it it gave me way better job satisfaction than just like entering in data which i love like i like i am that guy but then i got to go out and do that which is kind of like my former self so i like i had a lot more fun doing that than than uh than just sitting behind the computer and, and statusing things and giving reports mm-hmm. like it, it was much more meaningful so anyway uh statusing really quick and and the one behind me the 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 tacting software um it's more work package based so you can really track like the information better by like if you have five scopes of work that you've packaged together each one of those has their own thing like you see like multiple colors on on this mm-hmm. one right here right so those two open up as two separate cards that have information that you can track by that card and it like you can upload pictures there's field that like it's it's awesome on your phone like really great QR code integration, really great. I mean, cutting edge stuff for free mm-hmm. that you can use mm-hmm. today. You just have to go and talk to them and apply. So, um, awesome. Su- super, super more streamlined, easier to understand trades. Use it. Love it. Anyway, that's awesome. I, and I make it sound like it's all, it's all, it's not, it, it's not the silver bullet, but it shows you all of your problems. So you can actually do something about it versus like, I, f- I feel like with normal systems, you're just, constantly just trying to figure out well now how do we get back on track how do we get back on track it's 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 not proactive and this this is a much more proactive approach which i think is helpful so yeah now look i appreciate it and i love your excitement and passion obviously this works for you and i think for people who are listening out there they're going to say that they're at least curious enough to go out there and try some things and if it's free there's no barrier to entry i think i love that idea i think all software should be free to start with and then Amen. obviously this helps clients at the end of the day, make their own informed decisions about what works and what doesn't work. You know, trial and error is part of the process, but thanks for your time today. Dale, anything from you, mate? Uh, maybe just one or two last ones, maybe quick fire ones. Um, Spencer, cost, cost can be integrated. Yes or no? Yes. Uh, on this system. And yep. you can, you can technically, I mean, you could do anything in Excel, but at a basic level in Excel, yes. And here, yes. And actually payment too. Like I'll drop that little carrot, like, Think about mm. payment on attack time where it's like, if you finish your work package and it's signed off by the project manager, payment is automatic on a tax rhythm, not wow. uh, monthly or whatever. Like, yeah, there's nice. a lot of cool things you could do with it. And, and not that any of us are going to link our payments to it, but yes, like a lot of cool stuff, costs and payment. Yes. And one more on that um, 3D, 4D, can it be all integrated? Yep. yep. Fantastic. Already, already. Yes. And, it, and it's actually automated. <laughs> So you could, you could say this work package is this, this uh, element. And if your tree is right within your BIM and it knows those types of elements, it automatically, the AI starts looking at, okay, you define this as a, as a zone. So the red in this area are these elements, those same elements are here. Is this all in that zone? Is this the same? And it's automation versus like within synchro where you have to, aut- you have to see every single little thing has to be linked. It automates that and makes 4D way quicker. Wow, wow. Wow. Interesting. And last one from me. Is it true or, or, or not that you were once also a bounty hunter? I, I was not a bounty hunter, but I was a... <laughs> That's super funny. I was a private investigator. And Ooh. I'll give one really, really quick five second, 10 second story. Uh, the it. funnest thing was that I got to take pictures of a guy uh, out of my car that was claiming on his insurance that he broke his back and he was mowing his lawn and he did not get the payment because he was lying. <laughs> so yeah, I was hired by some cool people to do some cool stuff. And that was for a very short time, but yeah, that was super fun. So <laughs> <laughs> I bet you got some stories there and probably could write a, a book or a couple of blogs on that. But, um, <laughs> hey, look, Spencer, it's been fantastic to have you on the show. Um, as, as Val saying, we love your energy. We love your passion for this. Um, thanks for sharing it with our audience and our listeners as well um as you say it's you know, it's new to to val and i so you know it's mm. it's something that i think the uk and australian industry needs to look at particularly as you say the construction industry so um yeah we'll be sure to to spread the word as much as we can but look before we let you go any final thoughts that you want to leave our listeners with um never never accept what we did yesterday for how we should do it today always look to improve and if you see something wrong with tact, change it and make something better. And I am on board. Like, let's do this. Awesome. Awesome. I love how awesome. you're making yourself available. And thanks so much <laughs> for that, Spencer. Val, any final thoughts from you? 
No, that was great. I mean, I love the energy and I love the uh, other graphics. I think visualization is the way to go for forward-based planning. Um, and I don't know why we don't do enough of it. Uh, we should be challenging ourselves in the planning area more. Uh, but I think for our listeners, they get a lot of chunks of inspiration out of this uh, episode. So uh, yeah, thanks for your time, Spencer. Really appreciated it. Thanks, guys. Keep doing what you're doing. Love it. No, we, we loved having you on the show. So folks, as you've heard it, that is all the time we have on this episode. But remember, please, before you go, help us pay it forward by sharing a link to this episode on your favorite social media. Once again, a massive thank you to our guest, Spencer Easton. And thank you all for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me and Val, it's bye for now. <laughs>